So very good afternoon, everyone. I I think uh, one thing which has been there and that's been on top of my mind. In fact, uh, about uh, 15 days back in one of my internal meetings, uh, uh, my CRO, my CFO, and we were all there. And uh, we were talking about uh, what's happening on WhatsApp. No, I think so many information is coming through and, and there's so much panic is there and how things are going. Uh, and I told my um, uh, CRO that uh, why should we only be on WhatsApp? I think this WhatsApp activism is not going the right um, uh, direction. Uh, then my CFO said, then what should we do? I said, uh, why should we not start something of our own? I think in the insurance company, we have such a lot of uh, network. We have such a huge army of uh, people. We have so many clients, such a lot of information, no, so many doctors. We do health insurance also. So many things are with us. Why can't we have an ambition to save lives? No, a minimum of 5,000 lives. And why don't we start from there? And then my senior team member said, yes, that sounds pretty pretty interesting. We can do that. I think my IT had sort of set up in about just uh, two days' time an app. And then we linked together, sent it to all our team members, 10,000 of them. Half of them became COVID worries and that. And then all the information, be it for oxygen, be it for no uh, medicine, started flowing in that. And then I started reaching out to my friends, you no. Know? And the first friend, you no, know, when it comes to anything of uh, medical, is uh, Dr. Prakash, you no, know, uh, very dear friend of mine, uh, a renowned uh, doctor in his uh, previous avatar, uh, has worked all across, been in Singapore, and a very well-known doctor. And then when you have enough excitement in life and you want to be excited more, you join an insurance company. That's what doctor did. You know? From there, he joined and uh, joined an insurance company. Start. I called him up uh, yeah, on the Sunday that. and said, Doctor, uh, no, I'm not very comfortable with what's happening in WhatsApp. The panic is getting created. We should make a difference. And doctor said, yes, uh, we are actually doing a difference. I'm, I'm, I'm providing free consultation to a lot of people. And I'm also very upset with the way uh, the news keeps on flowing about what to be used. And patients themselves are trying to figure out you know, what they should be putting on in this kind of panic scenario. But we should have a conversation. So I said, Doctor, if that be the case, then let's get some more friends together. And let's have a conversation on the do's and don'ts of COVID and the panic and, and the WhatsApp negative you no know, information which is flowing through and the panic which is getting created by that and the complications beyond that. You no, know, and deaths are happening because people do not know how to handle such a situation. And this is why I thought today's TNT is very, very relevant. So all of us, let's try and put this conversation together. Let's talk about points which is there. If you have any question, write to us. We'll be happy to you know answer it. So in the entire panel, I'm the only one who is a non-doctor. So no, uh, anything which I say is just a layman's uh, thing. I think the rest are experts here. So I mentioned to you, Dr. Prakash, let me come to Dr. Sridhar. No? Again, a very renowned doctor. He's still practicing. And he's been in UK for 15 years. He practiced there. Now here in India, in Chennai, in the Kaveri Hospital. And he's doing an amazing job there. And one of the rare experts who's gone through all the ifs and buts and the doubts which is there. I think we could get him there. And it's very good of us to have him here. And then we have Dr. Kavita Krishna, again, a consultant in Pune, and she has no worked in different uh, departments. She's a cabinet she's got over 150 papers published in her name. Unbelievable. So when I thought, okay, these are my good friends, put them together, and let's talk about um, the COVID issues. So Dr. Prakash, let me start with you, no, to begin with. I think the day I called you up, and you were very, very upset in terms of how things are happening, and what is no, going on in the current scenario, in terms of the misinformation uh, people have, and the way they're panicking for things and what company leading to. So just want to hear from you in terms of what's your view on this and what would you not talk about as a doctor and insurer now in terms of how you look at things. So this is a very critical <clears throat> critical phase today what we are facing. And uh, there is a lot of good effort done by the hospitals and doctors who are really, you know, um, betting their life to save the lives of people. But at the same time, what is wanting is some sort of standardization, standard protocols, and some clarity. Because doctors means it's not like you know those who are, some of them are privileged to work in a corporate hospital where there is a guidelines protocol and colleagues to assist them. But a hospital which is 30 bedded, 50 bedded in a suburban or rural area, the doctors who are there, they should also be familiar with the guidelines. And there should be a proper clarity on how we should manage COVID patients. Because what I'm worried about, Mr. Tapan, it is not the disease which is causing a problem. Of course, the disease is causing a greater havoc. Apart from that, the treatment <clears throat> and the response from our end should not add further harm. We should not cause further harm at the cost of treating a COVID-19 patient. So I'm thankful that you have taken this initiative because through this initiative, we want the right information, as you rightly pointed out, to reach the people so that people can suffer from the disease and come out of it, but they should never suffer from the treatment related to the disease. 
So there should be a lot of clarity on treatment, do's and don'ts on when we should give antiviral remdesivir, what is the need for a steroid, when oxygen therapy should be given, or we, is there any irrational use of oxygen in steroid happening? What will be the problem if a steroid is given to particularly to a diabetic patient, a overdose of steroid which is not required? Will it be counterproductive? All these things I think you know we should discuss over this program. No, thank you, Dr. Prakash. I think that's why I, I bring in Dr. Sridhar because he's into the battlefield fighting it out no, and handling um, these patients out. Dr. Sridhar, what have you seen that you know, when, when you're treating uh, patients in today's era of digital uh, information, I think every patient is a double MS, double MBBS, no, and uh, whatever degrees you have no, on top of it, when he's coming to you, he already has or she already has more information than that is required. And they, in a way, create more complications. So what are your observations here? What would you want to talk about that that you have faced that this should not be done and that has caused some complication to the patient or a pressure from uh, from the patient's relative because they're so anxious, so panicky, they don't know what to do and they end up doing the wrong stuff. You unmute, Dr. Sridhar. You have to unmute yourself. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, uh, thank you for asking the question. Indeed, everybody seems to have a lot of information at their fingertips. And... Uh, an information overload is causing more confusion rather than giving us clarity. Uh, the problem I'm facing is for one one thing, uh, Prakash already mentioned steroids. So uh, we see all this headline news that steroids are life-saving. Uh, people think that steroids are the be-all and end-all of management of this disease, but there's a lot of nuances to it. You must know the right timing of steroids. If steroids are given early in the disease, actually causes more harm than good. So the timing of steroids is very important. So it's not enough to just see the headlines and say, right, why is my relative not on steroids? Or I've been diagnosed COVID positive, so I need to start taking oral steroids at home. So all these things are there because the information is there, but we need to look at the subset of patients who benefit from these interventions. After all, we live in an era of not just information, but an era of evidence. And we must use only those treatments that are proven to be effective. If you don't follow this, and there's no difference between what we do and uh, mumbo jumbo or old style bloodletting. The key to modern Western medicine, the key to the medicine that we practice as allopathic practitioners is to use only those forms of treatment that are proven to be effective. Having said that, the challenge that this pandemic has uh, created for us is in a very short time, we have had to learn about a new illness in which the evidence is still emerging. So we have a lot of studies that are coming out. So some studies are conflicting with each other. Some studies are pointing to the same thing. So uh, this confusion exists not just among uh, general public, but even among medical colleagues, there are differences of opinion. Yeah, but again, the point, Dr. I, the black fungus now in the news, no? And they're seeing because of the oxygen and and uh, maybe a person diabetic or overuse of steroids is leading to further complication, which is actually not only you know, leading to loss of lives, but also loss of limb or loss of eyesight. And it's creating huge kind of uh, havoc. Now, that's all over the newspaper nowadays, you no? Know? And again, the panic sets in there. What exactly is this and why does this happen? And what are the precautions one should take should not don't get uh, caught in this kind of scenario and really after recovery from COVID, then this is the next phase which is coming through just after COVID recovery. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me tell you this. The incidence of this black fungus or mucormycosis has definitely gone up, but it is not a major new pandemic. It is still an extremely rare complication. So in my hospital, we have been treating uh, COVID positive patients for uh, ever since the pandemic started, so almost 14 months now. And we have not seen a single case of mucormycosis. So it is a complication. Some of my colleagues who work in very specialized areas in ENT and ophthalmology are indeed seeing this. And I talk to them, yes, yes. Previously, we saw five or 10 a year. Now we are seeing 20 or 30. The incidence, which was previously extremely rare, has definitely become threefold or fourfold more. But still, it remains vanishingly small. The key point is steroids are life-saving when used appropriately. And like steroids, like any other drug, every person, including uh, somebody who's never even picked up a, a basic book in medicine, knows the steroids come with complications. So uh, this complication of black fungus is vanishingly small. If the steroid is appropriately indicated, then we have to use it in those scenarios at the right doses. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, because as a layman, the problem with me is that every news I read, I feel I'm, I'm suffering from it, no? So now when I open a newspaper, I see black fungus. So I'm trying to figure out now that I'm suffering from black fungus. So I think that's a problem of most of us. I think when you open a newspaper today, it's become so dangerous. At one time, I should love reading newspaper. And today's time, no, 
I, I open it and by the time I'm through the newspaper, I think I already have COVID, I already have black uh, fungus and I already, you know, I'm going to die the next tomorrow day. So where is my will? I'm already thinking about all this stuff. It's causing such a lot of stress just reading all this. So good that you told that is a very rare complication and, and one should know. Have some early symptoms if it is so. So coming to you, Dr. Kavita, no, you yeah. have patients so, like me also, no, who get paranoid just reading all the information and must be bothering you day in and day out that, okay, I have got this symptom, I've got that symptom. No, but what are the symptoms in which we should actually panic and not don't just panic just reading uh, news and, and then yeah. so that. panic reading the only treatment is uh, assurance so that's very important so many patients just think they've got covid the moment they get some you know vague symptoms but one symptom which i think definitely is new and 99.9 percent .9 it is true is loss of smell because that was something which was hardly ever there before last one year so last year, this loss of smell was definitely a very important symptom in COVID. This year, it's not so common with the second wave and maybe the mutant virus. Uh, the other thing is, uh, which I found that the ones who have loss of smell have a relatively mild illness, you know, they have a fairly good outcome. So I always assure them, don't worry, you'll get better. Then, of course, there are other patients who don't have anything. They just come with some vague giddiness, vague weakness, and they try to ask you whether you have COVID. So, but I think overall the patients are getting more intelligent. So they wait for fever and all to come. But fever, if it doesn't go, headache, you know, severe body ache, one definitely should suspect. And with the second wave, the entire families have got affected. So if one patient has got COVID in the family, it's very likely all are affected. So there we should tell them, in fact, that if you're negative also, presume it's possible, they should take all the precautions. And uh, another thing I just wanted to add regarding the black fungus, even our uh, center, center, we've been treating COVID since the last now 14 months. So uh, the ones who come with mucor, we've just had three in our center so far. They're the ones with very high blood sugars. So whenever we need to give steroids, we have to see that they're covered with adequate doses of insulin. And the other thing is the oxygen that we give them. So the container which has water you know, the, for the bubbles, that has to be clean and has to have distilled water. So in bigger hospitals, that is taken care of. But in smaller centers where they're providing oxygen with cylinders or with just some oxygen concentrators, then they should see that the containers are clean. The type of water that is RO water or distilled water should be used. No, thank so you. That is, my... Yeah, that's a very valuable information. So next time, if any patient get admitted, they should just ensure the water is pretty clean if, if oxygen is being given. To the patient, yeah. I think that is. And the early signs are very classical. They just have a little blackening around the nose, a blackish nasal discharge, just a little headache, and with a little puffiness on one side of the eye or the orbit, you know, sugars are 300, 400. So it should be picked up early. That's also important. And whoever are on steroids, the sugar, it should be stressed that this blood sugar has to be controlled. Many of them say, oh, we don't have diabetes. So COVID definitely causes pancreatic inflammation and increases the blood sugar. And steroids add on to that with the stress. The sugars have to be well controlled as, even after discharge. That has to be emphasized. So are you recommend, doctor, that after somebody gets discharged by, uh, from COVID you know, and, and they've gone through severe COVID, they should get the yes. blood test done to see you know, that how oh, yes, the look like? Yes, absolutely. I call them after a week and two weeks till the sugars are well controlled. Many of them go back to normal blood sugars. But some of them, especially the diabetics, take longer to come back to normal sugars. So they have to be given insulin plus tablets. And I really go out of the way to counsel them, arrange for the insulin pens if required. We teach them how to take insulin, teach their relatives how to take insulin, get glucometers at home. That's a very important part of post-COVID management. But then the insulin from Nucord will come down. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. That was very, very useful.